Hello, everyone. My name is Eli Lake, Washington Times, New Republic, and I'm here with Matt Duss, a contributor to the nation and, more importantly, National Security Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Matt, how are you? Very well. How are you doing, Eli? I'm great. In the words of Tracy Chapman, don't you know, talking about a revolution sounds like a whisper. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, oh, man. So Egypt, uh, well, actually, you know, it's funny because I, who doesn't love Tracy Chapman? But um, I don't know if it's a revolution yet because we just saw, I mean, we, we now are, are told that there is a transition from mm-hmm. Mubarak's uh, one-man show, as uh, a friend of mine in Egypt told me last night, to um, hopefully democracy, but the people in charge of the military, and, you know, under Mubarak, there was military was also in charge of Egypt for the most part. Um, they have uh, dissolved the parliament, which is probably a good thing given the fact that the people in the parliament were there through uh, a r- ridiculously fixed election. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they're rewriting the constitution, which is probably also a good thing because Mubarak yeah. amended that constitution to basically right. make it impossible for anyone but his son to become president after mm-hmm. him. Um, and um, so all of those things are good, but it's also dangerous because if, if the transition does not occur, then you will be stuck with uh, pretty much what Egypt's been since 1952, which has been a military mm-hmm. dictatorship. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with all that? I would agree with all that. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's very important, as you said, to, you know, whether this is a revolution. I mean, the TV channels, the cable news channels have, you know, revolution on, on, on all their, their chirons and all their advertisements. but. You know, revolutions, as exciting as the word is, a lot of them, most of them, I would say, don't have particularly good outcomes. I think as Americans, we tend to, you know, we celebrate our American revolution rightly, but a lot of these things, you know, have a, have a tendency to be, you know, either seized by small factions that end up recreating a dictatorship or moving in, in very unpleasant directions, as we saw in Iran. So, yeah, it's, we're at a very, very sensitive juncture right now, to, to use a cliche. Um, sure. Now, let me give you the argument for why I'm somewhat optimistic. Because if the military is in charge of this transition process, which they are, um, I'm reasonably confident that the United States can use its influence uh, if it chooses to, um, which I'm assuming it does, though Mm -hmm. sometimes you get mixed messages, um, to steer events in the direction of... um, of, of a transition to democracy because the United States has enormous leverage over mm-hmm. a military because the military cares so much right. about that institution all mm-hmm. of the high tech gadgetry of these Abrams tanks and yep. uh, F-16s and other things, you know, at the moment the United States says you're no longer a client, really it renders the Egyptian military almost useless and mm-hmm. certainly very vulnerable to the attack of, of, of what you would assume would be still an American ally when Israel right. So in that respect, um, I think that that, uh, that very close relationship, which is, if, if you think about it, given the situation we are now, purchased cheaply for about $1.5 billion or $1.4 billion a year, um, mm-hmm. is giving the United States a lot of leverage to then represent the interest of opening up Egyptian society in a, in a kind right. of responsible way that doesn't lead to Jacobin purges or yeah. uh, the empowerment of radicals. And I think that, that right. that's like, uh, that, 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 you know, as, as, as haphazard as the U.S. response was, and it was very haphazard, uh, if you look at all the responses from various seniors, various senior officials and what Obama said and so forth, it ended up in a pretty good place in that respect. The military right. is going to kind of be the caretaker, and um, everybody is now on record as saying they want to transition to democracy. Right. Um, that's not so bad. Right. I mean, getting before I get to you know, Obama's uh, dealing with this, I mean, just to go back to what you said, I mean, everything you said is, of course, true about the, the leverage we have mm-hmm. with the Egyptian military uh, in terms of Quinn. But I would also mention very important here are the personal relationships. I mean, these officers have trained alongside, you know, American officers for decades. Um, and there are strong personal relationships and equities here um, and, and relationships at, at a lot of levels of, of both militaries and uh, probably one of the closest military-to-military relationships in the world, wouldn't you say? Well, um, yeah, it's funny. I make that argument all the time about Iraq, which is that the Mm -hmm. U.S. fought a war alongside many of the new Iraqi Mm -hmm. army, and that Mm -hmm. counts for a lot. And I think Mm -hmm. that that's right. There's so much training, especially at the officer level. A lot of Egyptians come over here, Mm -hmm. and they go to our military universities. 
They know our doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, right. In many ways, we're interoperable. Because of the Gulf War in 1991, the Egyptian military mm -hmm. um, fought alongside that. Um, and I think that that's where, when you see um, statements from people like uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney, and he says, I think Mubarak's a really good man, and you know, he, he, he recalls mm -hmm. the relationship he mm -hmm. had with Mubarak's military right. in 1991. Right. And um, that, I think, um, I think it counts for something if that influence is used in a way that doesn't just lead us to kind of an indefinite military dictatorship. Right, and of course that is the problem, because that right. is what it's done. I mean, this is the opportunity we have now, right. is to expand beyond just these relationships, expand beyond this status quo, um, right. into a deeper engagement with these civil societies, because these trends are not going away. I mean, these are very real movements and trends in these countries. I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of things that drove this, you know, revolution, uprising, whatever you want to call it. One of the most important is this massive youth bubble. You've got a, a huge youth contingent, um, some of them very well educated and very displeased with the lack of opportunity in their own country. And through the magic of globalization, they've been able to see very clearly what the rest of the world has and they want it for themselves. So again, I mean, getting ahead of these trends um, by moving beyond just this very kind of realistic calculus of military to military and, and control, you know, the tamping down uh, uh, relationships based purely on the, the imperatives of anti-radicalization is hugely important. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I would say that there are two people who kind of are prophets in this. Um, for diagnosing the problem of fake stability of dictatorships, I think that Natan Sharansky, who wrote his book with currently the Israeli chief of staff to Prime Minister Netanyahu, Ron Dermer, uh, got it absolutely right that what the kind of establishment foreign policy elite in this country and uh, and even and, and, and in Israel, we should say, as you were in Herzliya, um, mm -hmm. thought was a kind of stability through dictatorship was actually um, a boiler pot and was was really instability, as I think we've just, we can now, I think, agree that the, ver the notion that, you know, the constellation of uh, relationships the United States had that really began uh, in the Cold War and in the case of Saudi Arabia before the Cold War, um, that is is not stability, and that is that is that's probably going to be on the. Right, but this this history. argument, that analysis did not originate with Sharansky. It just he was someone who spoke of it in a way the conservatives could listen to. Okay. I mean, this is something that the academic left has been talking about for decades. Okay. Well. All right. The academic except left, except I, when the academic left talks about it, it, it magically becomes anti-Americanism. Well, I, I, well, all right. Um, I'm saying that Sharansky, though, specifically mm -hmm. wrote a whole book in the middle of the Bush era, which right. was critical of the, um, I mean, it was highly critical of, of um, the kind of U.S. foreign policy, and it was, and it came, it kind of came at the, at the right time, but I would say that Sharansky kind of identified that, and I would also point out that the academic left is a little bit inconsistent in the sense that um, many in the academic left, though not everyone, supported the Oslo process, which relied upon the dictatorships of Jordan, Egypt, and for that matter, the, 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 the Palestinian Authority to deliver the peace in exchange for the land. So there was a bit of an inconsistency, which is a support for the peace process, I think, has always also been a kind of support for the status quo of the constellation of autocracies and dictatorships. Right. No, um, I think I think that's a fair point, but I think there's, I mean, we could spend an entire hour unpacking all this, although I would yeah. mention that one of the kind of, you know, the, the bete noir of of many conservatives in academia, Edward Said wrote what I think yeah, I has know. become one of the most prescient critiques of Oslo. That Which was as that now, Howard Arafat, yes. Right. right. So, um, but there's but also Arafat I mean, going and back to we're like actually in an odd agreement on this. Point. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just right. to go, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but I, I, again, I think it's very fascinating. I mean, look at Sharansky for all that he says about democracy and freedom, much of which I think is admirable. I mean, you know, take his town square test and try to apply that to Ramallah right now, and it fails. And why does it fail? It fails because the PA is doing precisely what the U.S. and Israel have asked them, which is to keep the, the West Bank locked down. Well, that's but that's Sharansky's point, and Sharansky has been so critical of his critique of the Oslo process was precisely the failure to build in, enduring institutions that mm -hmm. would nurture right. civil society and exchange and in exchange to sort of rent the dictatorship. Right to be as brutal yeah. as possible in order to subcontract, right. if you will, this counterterrorism. And I think right. in that respect, he was uh, correct. And, and, and yes, you're right, there are others on the left who had made similar critiques in different ways. Now, but the other mm -hmm. person who I think is the real incredible prophet here is Gene Sharp, 
the um, kind of godfather of strategic nonviolent action. Because the mm -hmm. more we learn about the youth yeah. movement in Cairo, the more we realize that they are using the same techniques popularized yeah. by the students in Tianmen, the student movement Atpour against Belosevich. And you can go through this, and this all goes back to a three-volume um, book that Gene Sharp wrote originally, this is an incredible fact, commissioned by DARPA, the Defense yeah. Department's research agency, which is like the most anti-DARPA thing you can imagine, <laughs> that was a look at basically cataloging the history of people power movements and nonviolent action, which goes back to, he, he has examples in the, in the book back to the 18th century of Quakers trying to change things through nonviolent mm -hmm. action. And then... Um, and then basically applying it and kind of creating the first effort to try to do a rigorous strategic discipline for how to organize and bring down dictatorships. And he and, and this has lived on through groups like the Center for Nonviolent Action, Peter mm -hmm. Ackerman's group in Washington. Um, there was this uh, Change University that was written about in the New York Times article yesterday that looked at some of the history of this. We know that the Tunisian students kind of use this. We know that Iranians um, have um, looked to Gene Sharp's theories as ways to help them figure out how to organize in Iran. Um, we know that the Iranian regime has identified Gene Sharp along with John McCain and like someone from the CIA as like the evil kind of hunter <laughs> trying to take over like trying to Wasn't it know. wasn't it there that animation it was yes, like it was Michael Dean and George Soros? George Soros George. Like Soros, a CIA guy whose name I'm not remembering. John McCain and, and Gene Sharp, all four men who I'm sure have no idea have never met. But um, <laughs> they, so Gene Sharp, um, who is somebody who I've interviewed a, a few times I am a great admirer of his books, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, and I've certainly interviewed many of his protégés before, and I've written about him uh, on a, a, on, for a bunch of publications at various points. I would recommend our readers go and find themselves at Gene Sharp, uh, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, um, mm -hmm. or any of his essays, really. I mean, you can kind of get it, and it's, it's, it's really, that's what we're seeing right now in Egypt, and I think that's what we're probably going to see in Jordan, I mean, I don't. Hopefully, I don't yeah. know. That's this is the wave. This is the way to do it. That's this right. is the go, that's the practitioner. So, right. I mean, before we uh, just one other point yeah. about you know organizing and, and technology. Um, I think after you know the June two thousand nine in Iran, there was a big debate over how much did it matter, and I think it, it was, a lot of people kind of overstated it, calling the Twitter revolution. But I think it's become clear that you know these you know they're they're tools, but they're very important tools um, to help. But getting bodies out in the street again is is really what matters um but just getting to the getting to the one thing that's fascinated me and i don't think i don't think has gotten very much coverage um and we can talk about the muslim brotherhood a bit more if you want I but when i'm uh, about three years ago i met with um a young female egyptian activist and this was the first time i had really heard from anyone about how important twitter was going to be to these movements and one of the interesting things that, that she talked about when she talked about using, you know, Facebook and, 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 you know, working online, doing activism online, was that one of the things that had made it a lot easier for younger Muslim Brotherhood activists and younger secular activists was the fact that this was online and largely anonymous. So that, you know, when a, you know, a, a young conservative Islamist met for the first time a young female activist whose ideas he had been engaging with and very impressed with without knowing that she was a woman, this was actually kind of greasing the wheels toward, you know, greater engagement. Um, you know, something that was very hard for the Muslim Brotherhood, the older cohort of the Muslim Brotherhood to deal with. So, um, I mean, I guess that's neither here nor there, but again, it, I think it does go to the possibility that some of these self-identified Islamists in the younger generation are, are, are far more open-minded. Well. I think that Facebook and, and Twitter and the social networking sites were used clearly in this in this Egyptian case, um, and it was helpful because of exactly what you said. It's anonymous. It's hard to track, and it's a way for getting the word out very quickly. And and, and it, but um, the techniques that were used, um, the discipline to adhere to nonviolence, mm -hmm. the right. strategic decision to completely right. not use any violence, the organizing techniques, the idea that you can, you know, sort of, you have to push and building coalitions and trying to reach out. I'm sure there were plenty of, like, these sort of secretive dialogues between um, people in the military and the police and so forth. I mean, all those sorts of things, I think, come down to a kind of broader discipline of nonviolent people power and strategic action. Right. And um, I think that, I think it's great. I mean, I love Twitter, uh, as you know. Um, <laughs> and I love, you know, I don't like Facebook as much as I love Twitter, but I, yeah. I think that you still need to have um, these basic principles. 
And then every story is unique to that country. I mean, this is a situation where, oddly, you know, I was kind of talking about this. You know, there were some economic reforms that were that were done in Egypt um, at the expense of, of, of really back going backwards on political reforms from 05 and 06. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think that when you raise the expectations in 05 and 06 and you let other parties run and kind of Muslim Brotherhood to run unofficially and you don't try to steal Mm -hmm. the elections as much and then you kind of take it all away I always imagine that plus of course the rising price of bread and the terrible Egyptian state of the Egyptian economy I I always thought that these kinds of things kind of were uh, but but raising the expectations and taking it away which is what Mubarak did is ultimately Mm -hmm. a recipe for um, evoking the ire and the anger of, of of a talented Young, young people who, who looked, I think, correctly, and that's the thing about living, I think, in a dictatorship, and I've only visited, I lived in Egypt uh, for a year, and I've visited other countries like that, but the thing is about, and I think, I don't know if you agree, is it's, the, it's this corruption, it's the sense that talented people, mm-hmm. who, if they were living in Europe or, or America or Japan or somewhere else, you know, could, could really do what they wanted, and then right. to have that sort of tamped down and saying, no, 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 you really can't do whatever you want. Right. Uh, the job is going to go to the friend of... Right. I mean, it's what I was know, saying about yeah. globalization. I mean, it's yeah. much, much easier for these people now to have... They, they know that it's not like this everywhere. They know that they, yes. they, they, can, de- they can demand better. Yeah, that's, that's a, exactly. And, that, and, that's, and so the, my sense is that um, that's the other thing, is that like one of the reasons why I think if you look at who, who joins uh, radical Islamist organizations... It's it's not the, the the guy who lives in the refugee camp who lives in horrible poverty. It's usually the mm-hmm. guy who who has like you know right. a master's a doctor degree in like engineering Zawahri. exactly who who has plenty of opportunities, but because he lives in yeah. this corrupt dictatorship, he yeah. can't he can't he can't fulfill his dreams. So he he rejects you know all these. Uh, so he joins or a, the, you know a disillusion yeah. trust of, a disillusion trustafarian like Osama bin Laden. It, there you go exactly. So <laughs> these are exactly so it's 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 not the the the, the you know, the, 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 and there are startlingly poor people in, in Egypt. Mm-hmm. There's incredible poverty in Egypt. But it's, 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 the, it's that middle class that the people who, if they were living in a free country, would, would have a normal life, would be able to have families that, that that's denied to, that they, they become um, revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, do you want to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood? Um, um, yeah, I we think can. We both think... have opinions about the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, I think we do. I don't know that we would disagree so much. I think, uh, you know, I, I as I wrote in the American Prospect a couple of weeks ago, I mean, A, I think if we're serious about democracy, we need to just come up with a much more coherent policy toward these groups. Um, I think Obama laid down an important marker in his Cairo speech, laying down the rules for civil society, no violence, um, but anyone, you know, should be allowed to participate in the democratic process. There's a recognition that this is a question of institutions and procedures that kind of firmly establish principles of pluralism um, in, in these systems. But, you know, political Islam is a real force. I wouldn't say it's a majority force, but it is a real force. And I don't think we're going to help ourselves by simply defining it outside of, of you know, the appropriate politics. Um, yes. I mean, I guess I would say a couple things. Um, I think if you believe, you're committed to transition to democracy in Egypt, which I am, you can't exclude the Muslim Brotherhood because they were basically able to run uh, unofficially in 05. Mm-hmm. And, and um, won 20, 25 percent, right? 88 seats out of 592, but the number of seats in the parliament has changed over the years. It's a very mm-hmm. complicated and easily rigged system. Mm-hmm. Um, that you can't, uh, in the case of the Muslim Brotherhood, you can't say I'm um, for this transition or for the opening up of society and then exclude them. I also think it's a mistake for us in the West to think that the sole source of anti-Israelism and anti-Westernism and anti, you know, and 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 Frank, for that matter, Islamism is going to be the Muslim Brotherhood. Egypt, mm-hmm. under Mubarak, has become, sadly, a deeply anti-Israel, and for that matter, almost anti, an anti-Semitic country. Yeah. Um, lots of Egyptians believe horrible things about Americans and Jews and the way mm-hmm. the world works. Yeah. And it's, I think, I've always, and this is my, this is my, my, this is only a guess at this point because you can't prove it. We'll soon find out, I guess, if, if indeed Israel, uh, Egypt does transition to democracy. Um, that these radical, outrageous viewpoints that you will find very common 
uh, even among Egyptian elites and Arab elites, for that matter, are a result of having the of, of, of the infantil the experience of being infantilized by a dictatorship. So if you do, if you know that you know it doesn't really matter what you think, because the government is going to continue to have a peace treaty with Israel whether you say so or not, then that gives you a kind of luxury to embrace radical and extreme positions. When I was in high school, because I lived with my parents, you know, I was for the abolition of all private property. I was an anarchist. <laughs> I was like a radical leftist because yeah. I didn't actually, it, it, my, because, because I had the luxury of, of not having to actually worry about the implications of what I believed. Yeah. And so that's, right. so my view on that is that hopefully, fingers crossed, that the experience of self-governance, of self-determination for Egyptians will have a moderating effect. And here's the other thing. Hosni Mubarak double-gamed the West on this very point. He said, don't have any contact with the Muslim Brotherhood. I am your stopgap. Mm -hmm. These guys are bad yeah. news. But yeah. then he would encourage this kind right. of poisonous thing in his mm -hmm. official media. He would encourage it. I mean, there were speeches. He was very similar to what Arafat did. Arafat would say, oh, I'm your, your best friend right. when it comes to Hamas. But then he would encourage this kind of sentiment. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There are obviously other factors as well. Well, they keeping will, keeping yeah. the Islamist threat on kind of a low simmer. To well, that's exactly say, right. And, and, and also, and so you look at the state, I mean, Osmi Barak has done damage in a lot of ways to the, the, the dictatorship of Mubarak. And, um, you know, and, there, and by the way, Mubarak's dictatorship reversed a lot of the initiatives of Sadat. Sadat actually, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, tried to kind of reach an accommodation with the Muslim Brotherhood after uh, Nasser assassinated, uh, or I'm sorry, right. executed uh, Saeed Kutub. So yeah. there was... I mean, so, just, yeah. Go ahead. just on the issue of infantilization, I think I think that's a, a good point, but I would, you know, I, obviously there's a difference between state propaganda and, you know, private propaganda, but, I, you know, I, I mean, if, if you've seen the stuff about the Muslim Brotherhood on Fox News lately, and I'm not just talking about Glenn Beck, Although he is, I mean, I think you probably agree, he's just foreign, he's like beyond even propaganda. That's just like PCP. I don't know what he's, where he's coming <laughs> up with all that. I don't know where he's coming up with all that. It's like this free associating friend of yours sitting around the college room just freaking out. But, um, you know, you I, know I, it's I, bad. I it's, it's not just the Muslim Brotherhood. It's also the, the socialists. <laughs> it's code, really it's control code, the Muslim code pink. Right. It's code pink and the Muslim Brotherhood together at long last. But, right. you know, I think there is... Again, I don't want to make an equivalence there, but I mean, I, I have just seen when you talk, use this term infantilizing, I, I find that very interesting because I think giving the information about the Muslim Brotherhood and about political Islam that I've seen coming all you know over over cable news has just been. And I don't know if that's a function of just you know we got to fill the time and we have five minutes to explain this very complex problem, but um, the, the conversation over the Muslim Brotherhood here in the states has been so bizarrely. You know, just stunted. It, it amazes me because I mean, this is something. It's something very real. It's there, and and we we need to deal with it. And I just haven't seen. I don't know if it's unreasonable to expect the public conversation to be a bit more complicated or nuanced, but it, it just really hasn't been. I mean, I guess I would look at it like this. Um, I think that um, I haven't. I don't tend to watch a lot of cable news. I did see something mm -hmm. about Glenn Beck was saying about. Uh, I mean, I saw some clip that was making its way around the internet about like Switzerland and neutrality mm -hmm. and Woodrow Wilson, and I really couldn't understand it. No, it no, was... yeah, no. But just to, very briefly, his whole theory ends up with Russia in control of the Netherlands. Why yeah, just exactly. the Netherlands? I don't know, I, I... right? <laughs> yeah. um, and I, so I couldn't understand it. And um, you know, I, but, and I don't tend to watch a lot of. But I think mm -hmm. that the problem is that the the right doesn't. White understand that the Muslim Brotherhood is by no means the only force in Egyptian politics that would want to um, abrogate the peace treaty or mm -hmm. um, says outrageous and crazy things about yeah. uh, Jews and Israel and Americans and so forth. Um, I think that the left, though, is sometimes like it's let's not let's not fool ourselves. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, has at various points in its history been a secretive organization. Mm -hmm. um, it's true they did split with this, uh, the Qutubists and the Islam, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, but they also at least have given a lot of rhetorical support for Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They, um, the, the, the most popular, one of the more popular um, kind of lead, uh, spiritual leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood is a guy named Karadawi. We both know that he says mm -hmm. outrageous and lunatic things. Yes. Um, yes. When I was in Egypt, I found my experience with the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand, they were very sophisticated 
political actors, when they were talking about politically reform of the Egyptians, they sounded like liberals. But then there was the Danish cartoon crisis, and they sounded like yeah. uh, they was it was a, it was a, they were riling up Egyptians. They would send out these SMS messages that were um, you know extremely you know dangerous and filled with lies about like you know what the how the Danes were rewriting the Quran and all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, so let's, right. Well, now this yeah. op- this offers the opportunity you know to yeah. bring them and say come out of the shadows. You know, come and tell us what you want for Egypt, and then have people vote on it. Here's the thing, though. The, the Bob Wright, the blog father of blogging heads, does tend... Oh, Bob. Yes, right. Hi, Bob. He says the experience is that when you give these guys power, they moderate. And that's what we'd like the experience to be, but I don't mm. think that's true. We, um, You know, in Iran, the Islamists got power, not necessarily at the end through democratic means. They purged everybody in the part of the revolution, and they have mm-hmm. become more radicalized. Um, so it's not a guarantee that if you, if the Muslim Brotherhood was to get power, that they would become... Um, more moderate. In fact, what mm-hmm. I predict will happen, because they've said they only want 30%, they're only going to run for 30% of the seats, they're not going to contest the presidency. Um, they've, they've, this is from them. They've all said that this is what Ikhwan leadership has said, or Muslim Brotherhood mm-hmm. leadership has said. I predict they will become, contrary to some of the more moderate-sounding statements after in, in, the, in, the, in recent weeks, to Western reporters, I think that they will become an anti-peace treaty with Israel party. Um, mm-hmm. And that's kind of what they want to do. It's much better to not be responsible for the economic miseries of Egypt, yeah. the bang on the Egyptian military for still being uh, in a treaty with Israel. And um, in that respect, um, I think that they're, you're going to see them embrace uh, what we would consider to be more extremist views bec- as, a, mm-hmm. as a function of the fact that they're kind of participating as a minority party in the system. That's my sense. Right. Well, I mean, first, if they want to run on that, then, um, again, that's... That's what democracy yeah, they, is all about, right? That's, that's democracy. I mean, if Egyptians want to give up the benefits that have accrued to them um, right. from that treaty, then, you know, that's that's democracy. But I think this also gives us a good opportunity very quickly, uh, before we move on to Iran, to just talk about um, the Herzliya conference that I attended last week in Israel. It's it's uh, Israel's leading national security conference. Happens every year. This was the 11th year. And, you know, the and Egypt had been going on for just two weeks before, and it was it hung very, very heavy in the air. Um, and, and just to, you know, obviously Egypt has been very, very important to Israel, the, the Camp David Accord, and just more, you know, the, the fact that for 30 years Israelis have not had to really worry about their eastern front. Um, and now that's gone. And now I don't think people aren't really worried that, you know, all of a sudden Egypt is going to attack Israel. But it's just this idea that we haven't had to really think about this, and now we've got to put resources into thinking about different possibilities that could could occur here. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it was very a very strong sense of that at, at the conference. The uh, dialogue goes as follows: Egyptian politician says, "We don't like the treaty with Israel." Israeli politician says, "What? You don't like the Sinai?" <laughs> I'm sorry. Or like that, or 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 possibly, but, you know, you you want another taste. Yeah, it's something. Something like, it's just it, it's like yeah. at this point it's so unrealistic. The Egyptian military said, I think last week at some point, we're not we're keeping the treaty going, okay? Mm. And so what'll be interesting is to see how this works out in this transition. Will it be a democracy for domestic affairs, but then, mm-hmm. you know, affairs of state or the strategic profile will still remain in the in the custody of the of the military? That's a very ser- that's a possibility. Yeah. And by the way, if that happens, that's kind of, um, what is that? That's quasi-democracy? I don't know what that is. But um, if that happens, then, you know, you will find that you will, you probably have a lot of Egyptian political leaders continue to say these things. Now, if you then chance it, if you roll the dice and you say, okay, no, no, we're going to have real democracy for Egypt, and the political leadership is going to make to be in charge of Egypt's foreign affairs and not the military, mm-hmm. if that's the case, it'll be very interesting because if you were to say that we want to withdraw from the treaty or we want to put it to a referendum or we want to see... You know, we want to add, we want to amend the treaty, or we want to do all these things and sort of muck around with that. That's very dangerous. That could end up very badly for Egypt. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, that could be, if you were the party that was elected and as the anti-peace treaty party, because mm-hmm. for 30 years you've been hearing this poison about how terrible the Israelis are, and then you, you say, okay, we're going to finally do it, and then there was a war, that would be kind of disastrous for you, politically. Well, and yeah, I agree, you know, I agree. Yeah. But I don't... I mean, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, because, yeah. again, this is another one of those questions we could go on and on yeah, about. Sure. But I think, 
I think I, I totally agree with you. I mean, the, the, the government in, in Egypt has been fomenting a lot of this propaganda against Israel. But at the same time, there is something very real about the Palestinian issue among, among Egyptians and among Arabs. And I, I don't think we can dismiss that. I make the parallel here between Americans and Israel. I mean, among Americans, you know, including among people like myself who grew up in the Christian church, the kind of cultural identification that exists between Israelis and Americans is very strong. It goes deeper than just kind of a... Yeah. You know, than an intellectual construct. It's something that's cultural and emotional and, and spiritual. And I think that's true not of the, Egyptians. Not the left-wing Protestants. They're with the Palestinians. That's a fact, Matt. That is a fact. No, no. The evangelicals no, but, and the Baptists, I'm actually going to disagree with you. I think it's no, 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 Zionism no, they, is a uh, political idea. It's not because mm -hmm. of this affinity of Judeo-Christian whatever. Because, you know, frankly, if you really look at it and you just you, 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 you wipe away the bullshit, there's actually a lot of similarities between Islam and... Judaism and Christianity. There's a lot of the same stuff. I mean, there's differences, but sure. it's not like people who want to say that Islam is, you know, it's it, the Islam, you know, as as Christopher Hitchens says, plagiarizes the other, you know, both <laughs> testaments, you know, from yeah. the Quran. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, the, you find a lot of similarities. Um, I think it's because Zionism has become a conservative, as, if Zionism, I think, started in some ways as a left wing political idea because of all the kibbutzim, these collective farms and so forth. And then with the prosperity and strength of, is of Israel and the reality of Jewish power, it became something more of a conservative idea in the current climate. So conservatives tend to like Zionism in Israel. And I think progressives are no longer uh, really, you know, they're no, no longer, they no longer like Zionism as much because as they did maybe a generation ago when, I mean, if you remember. Or we, no, we I think it comes down to how you define Zionism. Okay, to be fair, I mean, if your Zionism is, is that, you know, we'll continue to occupy the West Bank and continue to colonize the West Bank, yeah. you know, that's just a basic, that's just a difference of values. Well, but I don't, I mean, first of all, that's not my Zionism. And second of I'm all... I'm glad to hear that. Well, it's, I mean, I, I've never, I'm a two-stater. Um, but it's, now, the, see, I don't think it's the, I, I, know, I always thought that that was not the right question. I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but I think that it's, um, at this point, how do you work out um, a way for Israel to do what Ariel Sharon wanted to do and the majority of Israelis wanted to do in 2005, which is, I think, to continue with the disengagement idea and then make sure that the, the, the response would not be, you know, rockets on Ben Gurion Airport yeah. or Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. And that is a hard, hard question right now because I don't think that anybody has the answer to it. I don't know what it, if these, if, and also if the IDF was to leave the West Bank, then we're almost positive that the battered and weakened uh, Palestinian Authority, uh, along with the great hope Salam Fayed, would probably also fall. So th those are those are some hard power, difficult right. questions. And it makes you wonder why Netanyahu wouldn't be willing to do things that might boost Salam Fayyad, you know, simple things, Saloon, simple done. things, simple things, like, you know, stopping building more settlements, things that could help boost the moderate Palestinian leadership. Well, first of all, he did agree to a settlement freeze. And was the idea of the you know, settlement freeze was, the idea of the settlement freeze was to right. get them to come to the table, which they did not do. But he did originally agree to the settlement freeze at the, at the personal request of Obama. And my understanding of the Netanyahu position is not that they want to expand, they're not like, you know, destroying homes and like building new settlements like the, you know, Israeli governments of the 19th, late 70s and the, and the 80s and even during the peace process at times. It was more that they did not want to see the pretext of negotiations applied to, and in the case of like, I mean, it depends on what version you read, to say that they couldn't even build in Jewish neighborhoods in, in East Jerusalem. That to them was sort of like, well, that's just, you know, we're not, that's a, that's a no-win situation. And then finally, Matt, I think that the other side needs to sort of consider that there was a kind of agreement that was under, an understanding, at least under the Bush years, about how expansion of settlements mm -hmm. would be curbed. And um, I don't know, that deal seems like it would be working out pretty well. I mean, and also if you look at the Palestine papers, there seem to be some understandings among that, 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 that a lot of the areas where there was still mm -hmm. continued construction would end up in Israel. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated question. I think that the theatrics, mm -hmm. having having Lieberman in the government makes it hard sometimes yeah. because he is, he does say outrageous and bigoted things yeah. about Arabs and Palestinians. So, I mean, I'm not putting it all on the onus of others, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying that yeah. um, it's, I don't think it's as simple as like, you know, Netanyahu doesn't really believe in a two-state solution. Because I, I think that Israeli politi 
the, the Israeli polity right now, and I've made this point on other dive blogs, wants a two-state solution and they want to end the conflict, and they yeah. would support if they had any faith, but it's just... Well, it's, I mean, also, yeah. I mean, there's really no... They've really kind of put it aside now. There's no real cost to them. It's very easy for Israelis to just pretend uh, the, the occupation doesn't exist. I disagree. I think there's a huge cost. I think there's a lot of costs. One cost is that more and more Israeli officials can't travel to Europe because of this uh, legal movement uh, of universal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big cost. I think there's a huge cost diplomatically to the Israelis. I think that there's a sense that, um, especially among progressives, that Israel has become some sort of pariah state. Well, how, which, uh, but I'm saying, how much does that impact the life of your everyday Israeli? Not very much. I disagree. I hear, I hear from Israelis all the time how they think that they're seeing more and more Israelis leaving Israel and moving to the mm -hmm. West. and. Um, then finally, um, I think that there's, this, there's the, you have to think that there's got to be a sense um, that there is a cost to um, the accumulation of this rage in mm -hmm. the Muslim world. And it's not entirely because of the occupation. It's also mm -hmm. because there are people who seek to exploit and um, f foment the rage. And mm -hmm. at least for me, I, I tend to agree with Bernard Lewis and, and, and Natan Sharansky and uh, if I dare say the neoconservative critique, that the rage about Israel is a, pro is the, is a product, is the one escape valve, if you will, to let off steam in an otherwise closed and corrupt authoritarian system. And so in that respect, the Egypt situation is, I think you're going to see two things in the short term. The politics of Egypt will be menacing to Israel, and for that matter, the West. It will not be pretty. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's the big, you have to rip off the scab because in due time, um, my hope is that freedom will have a moderating effect yeah. on Egyptians. Well, this was really not the sense at, at the Herzliya conference. That's because Israel. Uh, that's because the Israeli national security establishment, like you know, they have this view of the Arabs <laughs> that uh, they just they don't. I don't know. They they're like, oh, believe yeah. me, I know the Arabs. You know, that's how they are. Well, yeah, and yeah. It, and it's you know, it's it's one thing to kind of know that and read that, but to see that said again and again in front of you is. It's, it's quite something. Um, and so to understand that this is the sort of mentality that's guiding Israeli policy, it's, you know, it, it, it's troubling. Well, look, um, I mean, not all Israelis. Sharansky's an Israeli. No, to be, to be fair. And no, Ron, Dermer, Ron I, Dermer, I know, I mean, I, I don't know this because I'm, I haven't I mean, but Ron Dermer co-wrote that book with Sharansky. Mm -hmm. So it should be said that Ron Dermer, who is an extremely important and influential and powerful figure right now in Israel, he's the chief of staff to Netanyahu, mm -hmm. agrees, I think, with Sharansky on this. And I think he would agree if he could see this. Yes, exactly. If he sees this dialogue, I think he would agree mm -hmm. with me uh, on this point. And I yeah. think that he understands. So there is hope, but you're right. There is a sort of national security establishment in Israel. By the way, in the labor and Kadima parties as well, that just has mm -hmm. no faith whatsoever in the Arabs right. to um, manage their own affairs, and then and, and and is looking for this kind of strongman. But this is. I want to make another point here. Israel did not install Mubarak. Mm -hmm. Israel is not responsible for the um, repression of, of freedom in the Arab world. Okay, this is not Israel's fault. Israel, uh, it's not America's fault even. I mean, America worked with these dictatorships because they were there, but this was this. These were the internal processes um, of. I mean, it's not all. Well, no, America's I mean, it's. Fault. I, yeah. I, you can, no, it's not all America's fault. But come on, as the the, the regional hegemon, the U.S. does have some some blame here. Okay, I we helped I maintain agree. this system for decades, and whether you know how much Israel was involved, I would say it was involved a bit. I mean, it, whether or not it's to blame, it had a very, very strong interest, as was made abundantly clear at Herzliya, in maintaining this status quo. So it's if it's I'm not interested in whether it's a question of blame or not. Um, the interests and equities were made very clear last week that you know many in the Israeli security establishment. Are not you know not at all enthusiastic about, uh, enthusiastic about Arab democracy and would very much prefer that things stay the way they are, but that's just not going to happen. Um, so it'll be very interesting for me to observe the way that the the establishment in Israel comes to grips with some of these things, and I it, it could go, you know, it could be a very painful process. But let's um move let's move to Iran. Right, well, quickly, okay, and I, and I, and I do want to move to Iran really quickly, but I yeah. would say this. There has been a kind of schizophrenia in U.S. foreign policy on this, in the mm -hmm. sense that, mm -hmm. that all the military aid going to the to the to the to the, uh, to the military in Egypt, all of the support and everything like that, and then the reliance on the bar diplomatically, all of that's true. Mm -hmm. um, 
But at the same time, you know, since the creation of the National Endowment for Democracy, after the CIA abandoned its efforts to um, kind of a, kind of play in politics, and they said, okay, we should do this in the open, it should be the CIA. There has been Egypt programs, uh, you know, maybe most of them not too effective, that have also encouraged that system to reform and to become more open mm -hmm. over time. So I just would point out that there that that the great thing, one of the one of the great things about America, American hegemony, as opposed to say Soviet hegemony or mm -hmm. Chinese hegemony, is that um, when America is your client and there is this kind of uprising on the streets, I really do think that when when, when Obama patron, said don't what well when, yeah when America's your patron I'm sorry when America's your patron and when Obama says don't fire on the crowds. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Chinese will do that in Burma. I don't think that the Soviets mm -hmm. did that in Eastern Europe. In fact, yeah. we know they right. didn't. And so the one thing is, is that when that freedom movement is ready, it's much better to have America as the patron because we do believe yeah. in freedom as opposed to these other... Now, it's true. The ensuing, you know, 30 years of military dictatorship and so forth, um, you know, probably not... You're right. I think that there is some responsibility. Of course, there's responsibility. No, but I, I get what you're saying. It's, it's that at key moments, it does make a difference for the better. And, and if you look at I, I mean, I just agree to, with that. To, and just, so the other thing I think that proves it for the most part is that our sphere of influence in the Cold War, the American sphere of influence in the Cold War, was South America, and they were all mm -hmm. juntos and dictatorships uh, until you know beginning in the 1980s, and then the U.S. did slowly transition. Even Augusto Pinochet uh, was slowly transitioned out by the American ambassador. Uh, Jesse Helms was furious at the time, but Reagan's foreign policy, and actually Elliot Abrams at the time, who was uh, the Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere, um, pursued a different policy, a pro-freedom policy, um, and I think that, that that is a that is a big difference. Now, I'm yeah, sure that a lot of the left pro, yeah. viewers pro freedom will say, combined with a lot of you know kind of pro death squad, but well, no, it was pro listen. There were <laughs> the, 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 did America support Brazilian junta death squads and Argentine and Chilean death squads? Yes, they they certainly did, and and and, and we know much more about the history of uh, the 1973 coups on September 11th mm -hmm. in Chile now because of the Freedom of Information Act and because a lot of mm -hmm. the, the records have been put out there. But I'm just pointing out that. At the end of the Cold War, the transitions in, for the most part, these countries became democratic. And then I would just submit the op the other case, with the exception of Georgia, like how are we doing in Kazakhstan? How's Uzbekistan doing? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. Um, well, let's, in terms, okay. I think that talking about American influence and American leverage gives us a good yeah. kind of pivot to Iran, yes. where we have very little leverage with their military. Right. Um, so, yeah, we saw yesterday, you know, tens of thousands in the streets of yeah. a few cities. Uh, we saw another crackdown. But, again, this, at the very least, it kind of confirms what I've heard from a lot of Iranian activists over the last couple of years, that there is, quote, fire under the ashes, that the green movement has not gone away. Yep. Um, it's still there. And, right. you know, it, I was glad, you know, obviously wasn't glad to see the violence, but was glad to see, you know, statements from Musavi and Karubi and other leaders um, appealing to the events in Egypt and Tunisia for their own movement. And Musavi significantly being put under house arrest yesterday for the first Unbelievable. time. Unbelievable. Yeah. No, and, and actually it was nice to see, I mean, listen, Obama and the administration come out squarely behind the demonstrators this time. Mm -hmm. There wasn't yeah. that hesitation that we saw in 2009. No, um, but I, I think events yeah. in Egypt and Tunisia yeah. gave that opening because, I, you know, it was my view that... I think the Obama administration, as in Egypt, they were very strong on the basic principles of human rights and nonviolence, and they were very careful not to specifically align themselves with one political faction over another. Right. And I've heard from a number of Iranians, Akbar Ganji, Shirin Abadi, that this was the correct move. But I think the, the I think the situation has changed now, and so okay, I think so. they were. I think it was appropriate for them to more strongly side with the protesters. So Matt, what are the next steps? I have an idea for the next steps. Let's make Iran pay diplomatically. Let's mm -hmm. withdraw Absolutely. their legitimacy. So instead of having a conversation that seems to be happening in Washington every four or five months, what are the new modalities of how to, uh, you know, come to some sort of nuclear understanding, which is never going to happen. Um, we should instead think about dusting off some of those old warrants from Interpol for, I don't know, Ahmed Vahidi, or mm -hmm. for that matter, Ahmadinejad, who probably uh, is responsible for um, the uh, there's all kinds of things that you can you can no, find. I think you see what I'm saying? Like they're focusing it's a on key, regime. Yeah. Yes, focusing. I think 
And I, we started to do this focusing on key regime actors who yes. have you know, personally been involved in human rights abuses. Yes. This is the right thing to do, freezing their assets, prohibiting them from traveling. They hate this. Yes. You know, yes. Their, their families from traveling. Um, I and yeah, this is. Agreeing. You know, I really no, anticipated we But, uh, but I, I just would say, while I'm, you know, after two years of this, I'm very skeptical about the possibility of arriving yeah. at an agreement over the nuclear program. I still think it's very important while we're ramping up the pressure. Um, of saying, you know, you have a chance. There are off ramps here. This this opportunity is open. I think this has been a very important message to the Iranian people and to the regime themselves. The regime also hates this. They hate having to make a choice. So, I mean, again, and even if there was a possibility, and I and again, I doubt there's a possibility given that the nature of the regime that's changed over the past few years, its its support is much more narrow, but it's much more extreme. Continuing to, to make clear to them is important that you know that they, that there are off ramps is important for the international community for international consensus, but also for people like Musavi and other leaders of the green movement too, you know who it, it kind of boosts their argument that it's it's not the United States, it's Ahmadinejad and this gang, who are causing us trouble. Yeah, I just I mean I said it before and people have been kind of like I can't believe it, but. You know, I don't know, like, as much as I'd like to see the um, suspension of the Iranian nuclear program, and I think it's an mm -hmm. important thing, mm -hmm. if it left in place a regime that, um, you know, the Iranian people understand it, most of the Iranian people think is illegitimate, that they stole mm -hmm. the 2009 election, that um, continues to support terrorism, continues to um, mm -hmm. spread its venom about America and the West, and all mm -hmm. of the other, like, kind of list of horribles. Um, I just don't know that it's worth it, and I think maybe a better message might be, as you sort of said, I mean, there was, well, said, we'll put this in the, um, I wrote a column, I wrote a, a piece uh, for the New York Sun a few years back called Praise Canada, because the Canadians, in I think 2007 or 2008, uh, no, it was 2006, actually, um, there was uh, the opening of the new UN Human Rights Commission after the reform mm -hmm. of that institution, and the Iranians yeah. sent a delegation to it that was led by... Saeed Mortazavi, who we both know mm -hmm. is the uh, prosecutor who uh, was responsible for the torture of numerous dissidents and the death mm -hmm. of Zahra Kazemi, the Canadian photographer. And yeah. so the Canadians said, listen, this guy is wanted for the murder of one of our citizens. And yeah. they went to the Austrian, uh, or no, no, the Swiss government, it was in Geneva, or maybe it was in Vienna, I forget exactly where, but they said, listen, when, when this man comes to the airport, can you please hand him over to us? <laughs> can you put him on a, because we'd like to ask him some questions as a result of a criminal investigation. And that's, I think, maybe the way to kind of handle it. Um, as much as I don't like universal jurisdiction when it applies to Western, uh, you know, and I think mm -hmm. it can, can be abused sometimes by people who have an anti-American agenda, and I think that's a, mm -hmm. an important problem. But um, as long as that is going on, which it is, I mean, Bush had to recently cancel some trip to Geneva, then, you know, turn, then use yeah. it against the Iranians. I mean, I don't know. I just, yeah. That's my sense. Use it against well, the Iranians. You know, I think there, there are tools to do this stuff now yeah. to raise the pressure. I mean, I think that, that may be down the road. Okay. Um, you know, but specific, you know, prohibiting them from traveling, freezing their assets. I mean, this has had an effect. I mean, yeah. I think it's, it's very clear that they hate well, this. Well, freezing their assets, we don't, we don't actually. The freezing the assets is like a symbolic thing because they, they make sure to put their money in places where mm -hmm. they'll never freeze their assets like well, Dubai yeah. and China. But yeah. Well, you know, keep get narrow narrow the options of places where they can do that. I mean, that does right. But I think it's it's like the idea that you can't you can't come here, and that we don't think you're legitimate. Mm -hmm. And like you know, having yeah. people walk out when Ahmadinejad speaks, um, and it's it's in some ways the very opposite of mm -hmm. when we saw the Council on Foreign Relations invite Ahmadinejad or Colombia invite mm -hmm. him to speak. It's the opposite of that. It's 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 it's. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a piece about in two thousand nine. Uh, even the Quakers wouldn't be meeting with Ahmadinejad in 2009. Yeah. And they, by the way, will meet with anyone. They really yeah. will. You know, they would meet with Attila the Hun to find out why but, they... But, you know, looking at... Um, but yeah. just, yeah, I think it's a question of, okay, what can we conceivably and realistically do to kind of keep pol open political space in Iran? And, it, and it's it's very, you know... We've got we to gotta think more creatively than I think we have done thus far. Um, but I think key to that is maintaining this message... That you know that we're willing to talk. I mean, by no means should I think we that should the U.S. withdraw from the offer of continued engagement over the nuclear program. Even though I, I'm I'm pretty confident that there's no that no agreement to be had. Well, I just wonder though if you kind of have this diplomatic process that 
I mean, I just, I just, I, I don't know. I think it can, it can kind of confers this legitimacy. And what if you, what if you said, listen, the price for you to get in a, in a discussion with us has has gone up. You have to, you have to do something to correct the injustice of 2009. You need to uh, hold another election. You need to acknowledge uh, the fraud of 2000 or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Where um, the price of uh, coming to the table, because they have managed, the Iranians have managed to make it to extract or to try to extract at times benefits from the, from the West for the mm -hmm. privilege of talking to them. Um, very clever. But you play the North, the North Korea game. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, at a certain point, well, the North Korea, I think, is different. North Korea, I think you just have to just deal with China. You have to say, we don't want to talk to the North Koreans. You're, you're, a, you're, a, you're, a, you're, a, you're a joke. You're a, you're just talk to the Chinese. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's on you, mm -hmm. China. Like, that's yeah. the, the policy, because it is, because the China, China can, can, can change North Korean behavior in a second, but it doesn't choose to. Um, whereas in, the Iranians really are an independent state. They don't have a patron. In the, they don't. They're not, and mm -hmm. they're no one's client. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which is very important to them. Yeah, it is very important to them, and you know, good for them. But, um, but they also, you know, they and so, so you don't have. That's my point about the difference between Egypt and Iran. Like Egypt, mm -hmm. we were, you know, it mattered that the United States said don't fire on the demonstrators. Yeah. If the U.S. said don't fire on the demonstrators and to the Iranians, they would say, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, yeah. And the response would be, kill more of your scientists. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I don't. We don't know. Those are unsolved murders. We don't know. We don't know. More All right. Well, there. I got to. Uh, Me too. Got to. Got to close this up. Nice talking to you. Good talking to you, Matt. See you soon. Okay. Bye bye.